feet. Grab your Bibles, open up to, uh, to Matthew chapter 5. This is where we are, right? We're continuing uh, to go through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, really, as we continue to go through the book of Matthew. And, and here's how we'll kind of begin. Uh, what's your framework? Okay, what's your framework for deciding what's right or wrong, or good or bad, or acceptable or unacceptable? What's your framework? Most of us in church, uh, we, we would like to believe that the answer is the Bible, right? And to a certain degree, it, it probably is. And that's the nice, good Sunday school answer. But in reality, uh, the Bible is probably one of a number of things in our lives that influence our decisions. We are deeply, hopefully, if, if you're a Christian, if you've been a Christian for a little while, you're deeply affected by the Bible. But as Americans, we're also very deeply affected by what I'll call conventional wisdom, right? Like, what's kind of practical? You know, this, this whole idea of, you know, hey, if it works for you, do it, right? If it, if it, if it works, right? So there's this kind of this idea there. We're, we're also somewhat susceptible to cultural pressures and beliefs, uh, you know, around things like identity. You know, it, it, it's, it's our desires that really should kind of form us, and, and we should listen to those uh, because, you know, they're good, right? You can probably list out any number of other things. We're all deeply affected by internal and external pressures. Uh, and if you look back at the Jewish people of, of Jesus' day, there, it really wasn't any different then, right? They were deeply affected by the Old Testament law, right? That's, that's really summarized in the Ten Commandments uh, and, and in the book of Leviticus and you know, Deuteronomy and, and all these other places, right? They were deeply affected by that, but they were also deeply affected by Roman pressure and Roman culture, Greek culture that had kind of taken over and, and influenced the area. Uh, and so a lot of them had, had kind of adopted those in some ways in efforts, you know, for, there were economic reasons to adopt those, there were social reasons to adopt those. Uh, so Jesus uses, this is kind of a new section in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses this idea, you've heard it was said, right? But I say to you, as an opportunity to take this framework that people have, that these Jewish people had in his time, and challenge it. Like, hey, you've heard it was said, but I say, and he's going to go through six different things, right? Anger, lust, divorce and marriage, uh, oaths or promises and truth, retaliation and enemies. And, and these aren't the only six things that Jesus is really concerned about, though they're the only six that are, that are encapsulated in the Sermon on the Mount. But he uses these as examples for how to think. So today, he's going to talk about a topic that's probably very relevant to all of us. Anger. Anger. How do we deal with anger? I'm going to read what Jesus has to say about it. We're going to pray and we're going to jump in. Jesus says, you've heard it was said to those of old. I'm reading in Matthew chapter 5. I'm beginning in verse 22. Excuse me, verse 21. You have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you're offering your gift at the altar and, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Let me pray for us. Lord God, as we dive into this, your message that you gave to your disciples, may it resonate with us some 2,000 years later. Lord, we've all heard it was said. Let us today hear what Jesus says to us. 
Lord, and I pray that these words take roots in our hearts and that they heal our hearts. Lord, your, your, your parable says, may they, may they bear fruit of 30 or 60 or 100. God, may that be the healing in our hearts and minds today. Lord, soften hard hearts so that this message does not just bounce off. Lord, protect us from the pressures of, of friends and um, cultures and all that that might scorch it and burn it and cause it to die. Lord, don't let the rat race of, of, of chasing all the stuff crowd it out. But let it find its home in our heart and make us look more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, as, as we look at... Uh, as we look at biblical texts, we really kind of break it down into two different ways. We, we ask ourselves a question, how do you understand the scriptures, right? That's step one. You, you can't look into the Bible, interpret the Bible, what does the Bible have to say without understanding, right? What is the scripture trying to say? What's Matthew? What was Jesus trying to say? Then we take it and we say, okay, how do I then apply it to my life? So as we look at the scripture, the, really the teaching that Jesus is giving here is quite simple, Right? There, there's, there, there's no, like, you know, kind of crazy here, there, and, and I can summarize it really down in, into two, two points when we're, we're talking about understanding the scriptures, and the very first one is, you shall not murder. Right? Jesus says, you have heard, it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will, will be liable to judgment. You know, there was, there was really nothing controversial about this statement when Jesus made it. You shall not murder is the sixth commandment right? It's word for word in Greek, the sixth commandment in the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But the evilness and wrongness of murder has been part of the Jewish moral code for, for 2,000 years. And really, if you go even further back than that, from, from, from Moses and the law, really, you go all the way back to Noah, right? As Noah gets off the boat, which we may need to build today, right? God says, if you murder, like if you spill the blood of others, so shall your blood be spilled, right? I mean, there's this promise all the way back to the refounding of the human race through Noah. So it's uncontroversial. The taking of another human life without proper justification is wrong, right? And we can go down the kind of rabbit trails, doesn't include you know, self-defense or accidents, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus says, if you're guilty of murder, you're liable to judgment. You're liable to judgment from the court. You're liable to judgment from the council. You're liable to judgment from God. Now, like I said, that's relatively uncontroversial. And here's the rub. What has developed in, in Jewish life and in Jewish thought is, is a tradition that says so long as you don't actually murder somebody, you've kept the commandment. You've fully and completely kept the commandment and you have no guilt at all before God. And so what developed was this system really of behavior regulation. In other words, it, it was a morality of the hands, like what you did, but it left untouched the heart, what you are, what your motivations are, didn't really matter. What your thoughts were, nobody heard those. What your imagination dreamed up, not really covered. If you didn't actually kill someone, didn't matter whether you hated them or cursed at them or despised them or, 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 or whatever, right? It's, it's irrelevant. The command is you shall not murder. Well, I didn't murder them. Okay, you're good. Like, oh, okay. And everybody knew this and was comfortable with this. Like the rabbinic traditions and laws codified this into everyday life. Everyday life and the scribes and the Pharisees, right? They all lived it and dictated it to the average Jew. And so it's into that framework that Jesus walks up on the Sermon of the Mount, pulls the pin on the hand grenade, and just drops it. And he says, but I say to you, I say to you, anger brings the same guilt as murder. Jewish tradition said that, right, it was just a morality of the hands, but Jesus says, no, no, no. Murder's a matter of the heart. Jesus says anger is just murder in its infancy. 
right? It's, it's what starts the whole chain. And Jesus says anger brings the same level of guilt as murder itself. And now this, this was, we, we look at that and we've been conditioned by somewhat by 2,000 years of Christian thought. And we're like, well, yeah, of course, right? That was mind-blowing to them. That what was going on on the inside was just as important as what's happening on the outside. God is saying that what you do is a matter of your hands. Yes, what you say, what you do, how you do your actions, critically important. But what you are on the inside, it's hand and heart. And Jesus gives them three examples, right? If you, uh, I say to everyone who's angry with his brother, you'll be liable to judgment. Now notice, that's the exact same phrase you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judge. Same phrase, same penalty. If you're angry, liable to the same judgment as murder. And whoever insults his brother, that's actually this, this Hebrew term called raka. Some, some of your translations may still have it in there. It means idiot or moron. Like whoever calls his brother an idiot, right, is liable to judgment and to the council. And whoever says, you fool, is worthy of hell. You're like, hmm, okay. Like, I look back over my week, and I'm like, ooh. Like I said, the teaching that Jesus gives is amazingly simple. The application is a lot harder. Not harder in that it's difficult or tough to figure out, harder in that it hits really close to home. So let's make a transition here, right? I want to look at this as we look at anger. Jesus says, you shall not murder. Fine. Hopefully none of you have murdered anybody, and we don't have to deal with that one today. Don't murder anybody tomorrow, and we won't have to deal with that either. But you're probably going to get angry at some point, or you have gotten angry at some point. Maybe you got angry this morning on the way to church, like, "Ah, just get in the car, right? We all have to deal with it. I want to approach it from two different legs today. One, I want to look at it from an individual level. Like, how do we deal with anger in our own lives? What does it look like? Okay. Where does it come from? And how do we heal from it? That's this leg. Okay. Then I want to look at it from another leg on more of a cultural level. What does our culture have to say about anger? How is anger used? And what might be a better way for us as a body of believers in church? Does that make sense? So we're going to look at it from a couple different ways. From a personal way, from, from a cultural way. All right, so here, let's, let's take this first leg on cultural ways. All right, listen, guys. Anger, right? Here's your first point. Anger has many faces. Many faces. Like, we, we think, we typically think of anger as, as, in the first one of those, we'll call it hot anger. And, and this is from a great little book. I forget the name of the author, and perhaps I should have brought it down here with me. It's a little, tiny little red book uh, that, the uh, name of it's like, I don't know, Little Emotion, Big Problem. I can't remember what it is, but it's on anger, and he, he describes these in there. Hot anger is the most familiar. It's easiest to recognize, right? It looks like explosions of temper. It looks like rage, it looks like wrath, it looks like hate, it looks like abuse, it looks like oppression. This type of anger is really, really easy to recognize, right? Because it's the kind of the fire breathing, like, I've told you 17 times to get in the car, if I have to tell you again, I'm going to kill you kind of anger, right? It's the type of anger that you can see it in the face, you can hear it in the voice tone, sometimes you can feel it in the hands, right? It's hot anger. And it's usually what we think about first when we think about it. But that's just one face. You've also got uh, what I'll call cold anger. Cold anger is, you know, it's a little different. Hot anger, kind of like a volcano erupting. Cold anger is, is equally visible if you know what you're looking for. It looks like withdrawal. It looks like silence. It looks like indifference or the cold shoulder, okay? It, it doesn't have to come out of your mouth to be angry. It doesn't have to be visible. It can be the withholding of support. It can be the withholding of affection. It can be the manipulation that comes along with 
that. It's like, I'm not going to bless you with my love, with my presence, with my, you know, whatever, until you recognize what you've done and I've extracted enough payment from you that I think you've paid your penalty. Cold anger, listen guys, cold anger though, it's, just, it's cold on the outside, it's not on the inside. Here's the best illustration I, I could think of as I thought about this. Cold anger is like the oven in your house, right? You crank your oven up to 400 degrees. Walk up to the outside of that oven and touch the doors. Maybe it's slightly warm, but depending on how insulated it is, it's cool as a cucumber, right? Open up the door, that's a different story. I am always, I, I keep telling myself, uh, I'm, I'm going to learn from this, but I am one of these people that when you open the door to the oven, I always just kind of look over and you get that blast of heat into your face that melts your eyeballs and sets your eyebrows on fire. Yeah, you know what it's like, but that's what cold anger's like. It's like, oh, it's cool on the outside, but if you could crack it open and look on the inside, it's just as hot. It's just kind of hidden. So there's hot there's cold, and there's really, there's a third one. I'll call it covert. Covert's kind of a, you may not even recognize it in anger, but it is. It's, it's sarcasm, right? It's, yeah, well, of course you did. And, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, can, I can tell, right? It's, it's grumbling and complaining. Like, I can't believe the boss did that. What an idiot. You know? It's gossip. It's that annoyed kind of eye rolling that you might get from teenagers. <sighs> With the hip thrust, right? <laughs> I'm not saying I ever get those. It's irritable. It's anger. Now, it has one more face. It, you can probably break it down into however many different topics you want to. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Uh, you can write it down. It, it exists. Uh, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because here's what, I, here's what I've seen in my own life and, and here's what I think I see in, in the lives. Most Christians use the concept of righteous anger to kind of justify unrighteous anger. That's really what we do, right? Righteous anger, it, it exists, but you probably shouldn't worry about it because 99% of your anger isn't righteous anger. Uh, Jesus got righteously angry. You can see it several times. There was a time he went into a, uh, in, in, into a uh, synagogue. Sorry, Woo, mine left. Went into a synagogue, and, and you know, there was a guy in there with a withered hand, right? And, and Jesus is asking the Pharisees and the leaders, he's like, you know, is it, hey, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath, basically? And they're all like, no. And Jesus gets mad. Right? He's like, that's wrong. Like, this guy's clearly in distress and in trouble. Why won't you? You'll go, you'll go get a sheep out of a pit, but you won't help your, your buddy? Like, Jesus gets angry, right? Another time he goes into the temple, he sees they're buying and selling. They've turned the temple into kind of a marketplace. They're, they're trafficking and, you know, and they're, they're extorting from people and taking advantage of people and they're clogging up, you know, where Gentiles can come and worship. Jesus gets so mad, he starts flipping tables and he makes a whip and, you know, he goes a little crazy. There is righteous anger that God is being uh, defamed or, or that, that, that God is being insulted, right? But for most of us, I would say, you know, put, put that out of your mind because that's not what you're dealing with on a daily basis. But it does exist. And now, here's the next question, and here's where we got to go a little bit deeper. Where does it come from? Okay? Where does it come from? Anger has many faces, but it also has many sources. Okay, anger is, is a secondary emotion. If you talk to psychologists uh, or, or, or anybody that kind of has idea, like anger is not a primary emotion. Anger is a response to another emotion. Does that make sense? Like you don't just get angry about something. What happens is you get fearful about something. The world seems out of control or, or you fear losing someone or, or, or something bad might happen and you're afraid and anger kind of boils up out of it. You with me? Happened to you? Yes? Anger is being misunderstood, right? If, if people would just listen to me and do what I want them to do, then I wouldn't get so angry. They see how much I want this and how much I care. People would just leave me alone and let me do what I want to do, then I wouldn't get angry, right? Anger is, is fatigue. It's like, it's like the tired mom or dad. Like, can't you guys just get along for a minute I don't have the emotional energy to deal with this, and then, right? 
Anger comes from injustice. I don't deserve this. God, I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I being treated this way? Why are my people being treated this way? Anger comes from depression. Things are never going to get better. Why? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with everybody else? Ugh. Anger comes from guilt or shame. There's something going on on the inside of our lives that we're not proud of, and it's just kind of eating at us, and it, it wears down our emotional reserves, and we get angry. Anger's got many faces. Anger's got many feelings. And we justify most of it. So here's the million-dollar question. How do you heal it? It's all, it's in our hearts and it's in our mouths and it's in our hands. Can you be set free from it? That's the question. And the answer is yes. Bring the source of that anger to Jesus. Not necessarily the anger itself. The anger itself should drive us to repentance, and we'll get to that in, in just a second, right? We have to reconcile with, with neighbor or husband or child or whoever it is. But you, it, just treating, treating the anger is like treating the fever for the flu, right? Yes, you want to lower the fever, but you want to cure the flu. You, does that make sense? You're, you're treating a symptom by just treating the anger. You've got to get the source of whatever it is and bring it to Christ, right? The, the world seems out of control, and so you get fearful. So instead of bringing that fear to God and saying, Lord, help me overcome what I'm dealing with here, Lord, calm my heart. Instead, what we do is we try to grab it and control it, and when we can't, we get mad about it, right? But Jesus says, bring that, bring the anxiety Give it to me. Like we see injustice in the world and we try to control it and manipulate it and eliminate it so it doesn't happen, but it grows and so we get angry. And Jesus says, bring all that to me. All the sources of anger. Jesus wants your fears. He wants your uncertainties. He wants your anxieties. He says, cast them on me. Your shoulders are not big enough to carry them, but Christ's are. He says, if you bring me whatever the source of that is, like I can help heal that source. The cure for anger, churches, is not to try harder. That doesn't work. I've tried it. It's not to try harder, but to rest more. To rest in the love of Christ. Listen, Jesus is not angry at you because you get angry. Christ isn't. Like he wants to heal and set you free. If you think about it, Think about the cross and the anger that Jesus absorbed. Right? As he goes, he is beaten, he is mocked, he is whipped, right? He is nailed to the cross, right? All the anger. People walked by and were angry at him. And all of it is poured towards him. And then on the cross, right, as he is nailed there and he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's absorbing the wrath of of God himself. Jesus has absorbed all the anger and then came out the other side on Easter. Christ took the whole cup and drained it dry so that you can be set free from anger. The cross paid the penalty. The resurrection gives you the hope that there can be something new in your heart. And that freedom allows us to move out in the world, not in anger, but in love. Not insulting your brother, not calling your sister a fool, but loving them, even, even as they persecute you, perhaps. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you, right? Bring the source of it, church, to Jesus. And we're going to give you a moment to do that at the end of the service today. So bring the source to Jesus. 
and then recognize, yes, now we've dealt with the disease of the heart. Now we account for the symptom, the anger itself. Go and be reconciled. Look at what it says. I mean, Jesus says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, right? So if you're in church, let me, let me, let me translate this into modern day speak. So if you're in church and you're worshiping and there you remember that your brother, that your mom, that your dad, that your sister, that your coworker, that your friend, that your enemy, like whoever has something against you, leave church and go and be reconciled and then come back and then come back and worship. Reconciliation is critical, right? Anger destroys our, our hearts and our relationships with each other and with God. It's not surprising that Jesus says anger damages and impedes our relationships with each other, right? If you've been angry, you've, you've experienced that. But Jesus says it also damages and impinges your relationship with God. You can't worship correctly if the damage of that is still in your life. So Jesus says, go Find the person and be reconciled. Maybe you need to apologize. Right? Maybe you need to explain. Maybe you need to tell them that you were the recipient of the anger. But Jesus wants nothing in the way of those horizontal or vertical relationships. And so he says, bring me the source and I'll, I'll, I'll heal it. And then I'll send you out to go and be reconciled with your brother, okay? That's how we deal with anger. The, the, the answer is not to walk out and go, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better. But the answer is just to relax, to bring that source, whatever it is, to Christ, and say, here, you take it, I can't carry it. And the blood of Jesus will wash it. Okay? That's how we think about that first leg. All right? That's how we think. Let's shift gears. We live in a culture that's really consumed by anger. Anger in our culture is, is celebrated, it's affirmed, it's expected. Okay? It's used as a tool to enact change, right? Anger is the primary tool of activism whether that's conservative activism or progressive activism. Anger is, is the political and cultural lever that we use to change things. And to a certain degree, that's to be expected in a world where there's, there's really no common moral framework anymore, right? That's, that's kind of the Enlightenment project, right? Is we're going to try to build a world, and this has been kind of developing for 500 years, we're going to try to build a world that takes the transcendental out, that takes God out, and we're going to try to build this kind of common moral framework that's just based on our own reason and our own feelings. And, and what we're finding out, right, is it doesn't work, right? That, that what it leads to is a very fragmented, kind of polarized kind of world. So we would expect a lot of frustration to boil out of that because we can't agree on what's good and what's right and what's wrong and all that kind of stuff. So you end up with these polarized kind of factions fighting each other for control. Uh, so you have to have something to use in that scenario to enact whatever you want to do. So anger is the emotion of choice. Cultural powers harness anger in order to achieve their goals, right? Whether there's right-hand goals or left-hand goals. So here's, here's, what I, here's what I think Jesus wants you to hear from this. Okay, anger trafficking, church, is the devil's work. Okay. Anger trafficking is the, de there's whole industries devoted to anger trafficking. Whether it's politicians or podcasts or publications, it's approved, it's encouraged, it's manipulated for political and cultural gains. Right? Bud Light puts a trans activist on a can, and then Kid Rock takes 12 packs out to a shooting range and blows them up and puts it on Twitter, and people clap and celebrate. Right? The state of Tennessee passes a law that says biological boys can't play on girls' sports teams. The left explodes in anger and rushes the state house. Why? Let me, why do you think anger is encouraged? You ever stop and think about it? Why, why do they want us to be angry? Your culture wants you to be seething on the inside. 
They want you boiling. They want that oven. They don't want just the oven on. They want it on and the door open. They want you to call your opponents morons and idiots, and they want to get it on Twitter and on Instagram and on the evening news. They want you to call them fools. Why? Here's, let me give you a couple thoughts here. One, anger crowds out other emotions. Okay? Anger crowds out. Uh, anger burns up other emotions in this whoosh of heat and fire and judgment. The softer emotions of love and mercy and justice and kindness and gentleness are just destroyed by anger. They cannot compete. So if you're angry, it's almost impossible to feel those softer emotions towards your brothers and your neighbors. All you're thinking is, how do I defeat my foe? Whether it's owning the libs or stopping the megas, it doesn't matter. Anger crowds out those softer emotions. Here's what it also does. Crowds out clear thinking. When you're angry, you guys know this, right? When you're angry, you don't think clearly. Like how many times have you, you gotten really ticked off about something and blown up and then had to go back and go, yeah, that was a really stupid decision. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? The problem with anger is you get so caught up in retaliation and judgment and consequences and sarcasm, it all gets kind of burned up and you don't think clearly and you don't make good decisions. So the question that you should be asking yourself and we all should be asking ourselves is why do those with influence in our culture want us all angry all the time? What is it that on our political side or the other side, why do they spend all their time trying to stir up anger? It's because anger in our culture is power. Here's what I think, and this is, you know, this is where we kind of... I think those on the left want to keep us angry because they're worried if we think clearly that we might look at some of the ideologies emanating from the left and go... Does that really make sense? Like, I don't get that. I think some on the right try to keep us bathed in anger because if we don't, we might develop some empathy or sympathy for people that look a little different than us. You might feel those softer emotions and it might change how you relate to other people. So we have to be kept angry so we don't think clearly, so we don't love. For those that claim the title of Christian, we, we somehow become okay with this idea that in order to fight evil, in order to fight sin, we use sin. We sin in order to win. Listen, church, anger trafficking is the devil's work. It doesn't matter whether it's for a good cause. Using sin to fight sin is the devil's math. It's the devil's math. He is laughing and dancing and just pouring gasoline on the whole thing. And it's all going up in a big whoosh. Jesus offers a better way. Look at what he says at the end of it. It's found in verses 25 and 26. He says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penalty. Jesus says, When you're angry, you're not open to learn or to communicate or to understand. Come to terms is it's a discussion thing. It's a sit down and talk and listen thing. Come to terms means to understand, why is this person like this? Why am I like this? What do we both have in common? What do we not have in common? What goals are we working towards that might be common goals? Where are we different? It's a, it's a discussion, and it can only be done with a clear head that's not inflamed by anger, and with a clear heart that still feels love and kindness and compassion. It's a legitimate desire and effort to understand. Jesus says, understand your accuser, right? This is someone who's after you. Go to them. Talk to them. 
learn about them. Work out some kind of agreement. Now, we're not always going to be able to do that. But the effort to understand, the effort to put aside the anger, the effort to, to think clearly and to feel fully, that spirit's work. Regardless of whether we're able to get to the same answer, and many times we won't be able to, but people will see that. Jesus didn't come to the same answer to a lot of people in his, his culture, right? The, the, the hard, the, you know, the Sadducees that were on the political left, right? Jesus clashed with those guys all the time. Pharisees on the far right, Jesus clashed with those guys all the time. He, he couldn't always come to agreement, but they were all, most of them were willing to talk to him up to a point. Seeking to hear and to see and to understand. Jesus says anger, right? Anger destroys, it burns. Bring me the source. Go and be reconciled. Think about how you relate to your culture differently. Ask yourself the question, why are they trying to make me angry? And then ask, is there a better way? I want to give you a chance today to, to kind of consider what we've talked about. It's a challenging topic. All of the, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, as I look at these, lust, divorce, oaths and truth, retaliation, love your, like none of these are easy, right? Some people believe the Sermon on the Mount is, is not meant to be followed in our day and age, right? That this is for like heaven. Why? Because it's so stinking hard. But I want to give us a moment today. The, the music team's going to come back up in just a moment when I'm praying. Uh, I'm going to ask our deacons if, if you would be willing just to kind of stand up and, and scatter around the room. Maybe you need today to go for prayer. Maybe you need to go and, and ask someone uh, to, 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 to pray for you about healing from anger, right? Maybe you need to confess something. Uh, these, these conversations, they're absolutely confidential. Uh, maybe you need to reconsider how you think about this or that. But I want to give us a chance to respond anger, it just burns everything. There's a better way. I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, uh, as we contemplate and wrap our minds around what you have done for us in Christ, that you have absorbed the anger so that we can be free from it, that you send us out not as people consumed by hate to speak words of destruction.